So into your notes now, you've added the intermediate value theorem. Now this is one of those theorems, it's one of those notes where when you look at it, is it making a whole lot of sense at first? For many of us, the answer there is no, because when you look at this, there's just so much symbol involved that oftentimes we don't break it down to what it's really saying. <clears throat> so let's try to actually explain what this is talking about. Basically, what we're saying here is that if we have some function that's continuous and we know we have two points, A and B, we know that if we're trying to figure out if there's some value on that graph that's like between the y values, then it exists because it's continuous. So like uh, between this y value and this y value, every y value between them does exist. That's basically what this is saying in a very different and very much more detailed way. So we're actually going to look at that detail here and break down how do we know that that's what it's telling us. All right. So first of all, it says, suppose that f is continuous on the closed interval a to b. Now, a little side note on that. That basically is every function family that's continuous on its domain, right? But that does mean that this closed interval a to b here has to include in the entire domain. Every, the domain has to exist in there. So for instance, like if it was actually, let's say, negative 1 to 1, that'd be fine if our function was x squared, but it wouldn't be fine if it was 1 over x squared, because remember, the actual domain of that is negative infinity to 0, and then 0 to infinity. So because this includes zero, which is not part of the original's domain, we wouldn't be able to use that one. Although that tiny little detail, it's not going to come up that often. Why do we have to talk about it? Because it's a mathematical definition and it has to account for every single possibility that could possibly happen. All right. And then n is any number between f of a and f of b. Well, f of a and f of b are just y values, right? So n is basically just some y value, some value of the function. In other words, the way they define c later, n is just f of c. It's f of some number is all n is. All right, and they give us some additional detail talking about how f of a cannot equal f of b. Well, that's because this would be a rather silly statement to make if we were saying, hey, what is it between 5 and 5? Does the number exist between 5 and 5? What? Why would we do it between itself? So it's just such a silly thing to say that they actually say, hey, this is not worth doing if a and b are the same number. And so then it becomes part of our definition that we have to know. All right. Now, that's kind of what this whole thing, that our intermediate value theorem is all about. To show you one other way, here's just a little squiggle graph I made, just, you know, random graph. And let's say we have two values. So here's my A and here's my B. It's basically saying that if I want to know, hey, does it ever cross C, which is some value between those two Y values, can I prove that it reaches that? Yes, because it's continuous. As long as I have a value here at f of a and a value here at f of b, it's going to cross everything in between. All right. Now, a reminder, all those different function types that are continuous on their domain, and remember, of course, it's in their domains, all of these different types of functions. These are already in your notes. This is nothing new, but basically being able to use this comes back to also knowing those. All right, now let's actually put it into some use. Here's an example problem, and sometimes it's a lot easier to understand these things through examples like this. So please write down this original problem, and then we're going to work it out together and see how this actually ends up working out. And so 
what we're trying to do here is we're trying to use the intermediate value theorem to show that there is a root for this function. What's a root? See, we get a little rusty on that, don't we? That's why we got to bring this back here. A root is basically a fancy term for an x-intercept. Now, if we are crossing the x-axis, that means basically we're looking for when y is 0, or in this case, f of x equals 0. So when it says we want to prove that there is a root between them, Basically what we're saying is we're saying we want to prove that between negative 2 and negative 1, we're going to cross a y value of 0. And so a y value of 0 will actually be in this function someplace. We aren't finding what the value is, like what the x value is. We're just proving that it exists. All right, so to do that, we first find the lower bound, which basically means we do f of the first number in our interval. So that's going to be f of negative 2 here. So I'm going to do f of negative 2 and just plug that into our function. All right, so the first thing we did is we plugged in the left side of our, inter our interval at negative 2. We see we got negative 5. That doesn't mean anything yet. Now we got to find the upper bound. In other words, plug in the other end of our interval. So I'm going to go f of negative 1. All right, and when we do f of negative 1, we should get an answer here of 1. All right, so. The big question, the reason why we did that is we want to know, we're trying to figure out does f of x equal 0 between these two numbers. Well, we started a y value of negative 5. We ended a y value of 1. Are we going to go through 0? Yes, we are. Because 0 is between negative 5 and 1. So that's how we're going to know. But how we actually answer it, well, there's a little bit more detail to that. Because we have to check off a lot of things. In our intermediate value theorem, remember that the first part says that it needs to be continuous on that particular interval. So is this function, f of x, continuous between negative 2 and negative 1? Yes, it is. Because it's just a polynomial function. There's no weird holes or asymptotes or anything to have to worry about in there. Its domain is all real numbers, negative infinity to infinity. And so the first thing I say when answering this conclusion is that f of x is continuous on our interval, negative 2 to negative 1. So that was the first part. The next thing that told us that this is going to be included between those two points, so we go to and, is the fact that I ended up with two numbers on either side of my desired result. In other words, on either side of 0. So I'm going to say f of negative 2 was less than 0 was less than f of negative 1. As you take a look at that statement right there, f of negative 2, that's just the negative 5 we found earlier. That's the work up above. f of negative 1, that's the positive 1 we found earlier. So notice that's why it's greater than 0. And why 0? It's 0 here because we're looking to see what, if there's a root between them. In other words, do we have a value of f of x equals 0? If for some reason this problem had asked, hey, is there a value where it reaches a y value of negative 2? You could answer the same thing, but it would no longer be a 0 there. It would be a negative 2 there. Our target has to sit between our two f values. Alright, so since it's continuous on our interval, and our desired number is between our two f values, then there is a value c, remember c is just that unknown x value, 
such that f of c equals zero. It's a long explanation, but notice basically what we're doing is we are checking off the pieces of the intermediate value theorem as we write this. It has to be continuous on our interval, and then when we actually find our two values, our desired value has to be between them, so I'm saying that it's between them, and then we're just saying that so yes there is a value where it reaches zero, but you know, I would understand what you meant if you said, and so there is a value that would give us f of x equals zero. It's just a little bit cleaner and fancier, I guess you could say. Technically, it's more accurate to say that there is a value c such that f of c equals zero. But again, do we know what c is? No, that's not the point of this. The point is just to know that there is a time when we actually reach zero. All right, and uh, just to kind of bring also one other view for this, uh, we just proved this algebraically. I want you to see what that would look like on the graph. This is the actual graph of our f of x that we just worked with. And so we figured out what was f of negative 2. We got the negative 5. We figured out what was f of negative 1. We got 1. And our conclusion was that, hey, there must be some value where it crosses the x-axis because that's the y value of 0 and it's between them. And you can see very directly right here that it does in fact happen. It has to happen somewhere because we're going between here and here. Uh, one little side note. Are we proving that it happens once and exactly once or could it happen more than once between them? Well, it could happen more than once. So, for instance, if our graph instead had done something like that. So, notice it's not necessarily telling us, hey, yes, it happens exactly once or anything like that. It's just telling us that it does happen. All right, now time for just more practice using these. And, yeah, for this one, you're going to need your calculator. Write down this problem and go ahead and use the intermediate value theorem to come up with our conclusion. And on your calculator, we need it because we're doing cosine of x here, and it's going to give us a decimal. Um, cosine, at this point, any of your trig functions, assume it's in radians. Unless you're told otherwise, assume we are working in radians. That is now our default position. So your first step is figure out what f of negative 1 is. When you do that calculation, you should be getting something that's about negative 0.46. Yeah, it's a big, long decimal. It goes on forever. I'm going ahead and just giving a couple decimal places here because we aren't necessarily worried about exactly what is that number, but rather really just a matter of is it above or below 0. So just a couple decimals will certainly give us enough information to work with. Alright, so in order to do this, you do those two calculations. f of negative 1 equals about negative 0.46. f of 0 equaled 1. So is there going to be a root between negative 1 and 0? 
Well, how do we know? I look at these two numbers. Is zero between those two numbers? Yes. And the root is where it equals zero. So yes, it is going to be there. So now we have to write out our answer and we have to write out that whole big conclusion. And so then that's what we end up writing for our conclusion. f of x is continuous on negative 1 to 0 because, of course, x, negative x squared and the cosine of x are both valid for all real numbers. And 0 is between our two f values that we found. So there is a c value where f of c equals 0. So there's our work that we end up doing. We find that f of 2 equals negative 1, f of 3 equals 16. So first question we have to ask ourselves, will our root that we are looking for, that is, are we going to be crossing 0 between them? Yes. Because is 0 between 16 and negative 1? Yes. And so that's what tells us that yes, it will exist. So then... We go ahead and we go to our conclusion. And the first thing we write in our conclusion is f of x is continuous on that interval. So on the interval from 2 to 3. As you write this, do not just write it out of repetition. Actually look at it. Is f of x actually continuous on that interval from 2 to 3? Yes. How do we know? Yeah, because this function, it, it's a polynomial function, x cubed in this case, is continuous. In fact, it's continuous on all values. Okay, so we know it's continuous on 2 to 3. And then we would also say our two values, f of 2 was less than 0, and that was less than f of 3. And then we say that there is a c value such that c, f of c equals 0. Same thing that we end each of the others with as we've been doing these. And once again, this problem is asking for the root. You'll notice that that's the most common application of this. So again, we're looking to see if 0 is between our two values. All right, so we do our calculation here. We end up finding that f of 1 equals negative 1. f of 2 equals a positive 1. So is there a root between 1 and 2? Yes, there is, because the number 0 is between those two values. And the one other thing we should check on here, though, is it continuous? So is this function continuous between 1 and 2? Yes. It's an exponential uh, and exponential is actually continuous from negative infinity to infinity. So definitely also between 1 and 2. All right, and so then we write our conclusion as we have before. So we'd say, yes, f of x is continuous on the interval 1 to 2. And f of 1 is less than 0, is less than f of 2. And therefore, there exists a c value such that f of c equals zero. That takes care of the examples of actually using it, but one thing that we haven't done here is really see what happens if it doesn't work out nicely, right? So let's take some other made up function here. It doesn't even matter what f of x actually equals, but let's say we have some, let's 
work on the interval here, uh, again, two to three, just because we used it last time. Uh, and f of two equals one. And let's let f of three equal four. And can we conclude anything about the root existing or not existing between two and three? So basically it's kind of a situation like this where we have some graph and f of two equaled one. Let's do that a different color. And f of three equals four. So then can we conclude then that it does not cross the x-axis? Well, certainly if the graph went like this, it's not crossing zero, right? But what if the graph was actually going maybe more like that between the two points. There it is crossing zero, right? So the intermediate value theorem that we've been using all day, if the two numbers are on either side, we can say yes, it definitely does cross zero, or whatever the number is we're working with. But if it doesn't, if that number we're looking for, zero in most of these cases, is not between them, we can conclude nothing. So the absolute value theorem can be used to prove the positive, but it cannot be used to prove the negative. It cannot be used to say there's not one. It can only be used to prove that there is one between them.